My area of specialty is synthesis of semiconductor nanomaterials. Has no relation, almost no relation to the field or to the area we're going to talk about today. Almost no relation, but I'm going to show you at the end that there is. Um, so what is this about this interface between science and art that fascinates so many people uh, in the country and out of the country? Why, why is this so easy to uh, uh, convey the importance of science to the general public when you start talking about the interface between science and art? What fascinates us? What fascinates us is creativity. Creativity of artists, creativity of scientists. And there's a lot of similarities. Maybe the thought process and the methodologies that artists and scientists are using are not exactly the same. What scientists call intuition, artists sometimes would refer to as inspiration. It's, uh, many people believe that scientists approach every problem in a systematic fashion. That's desirable. That's what we teach our students to do. You have to isolate parameters, meaning when you do an experiment, you have to make sure that all the components in the experiment are constant, but one parameter that you want to study. You want to study the impact of this parameter on the rate of chemical reaction. Let's say you want to study the impact of temperature on the rate of chemical reaction. You will make sure that everything else stays the same. Only the temperature will change. Otherwise, <coughs> you won't be able to know what's the impact of temperature on this chemical reaction. This is called reductionist approach. We are reaching a point in history, in time, where the reduc reductionist approach has limitations. We're dealing with very complex systems. And if we, let's say, you assume that you will have eight, nine, 20 parameters to study, it will take many, many, many years for you to figure out a complex system with a reductionist approach. Works of art are examples of complex systems. They have multi -component, many components. Artists use everything when they do their work. Um, paintings, there's a lot of a lot of paints, there's a lot of pigments that are in this sample. Sculptures, a lot of types of materials in the sculptures. Buildings, a lot of types of components, a lot of types of materials. Trying to analyze a complex system with a reductionist approach is very difficult. We have to develop new modes of operation, new model of thought, new model of thinking, new ways to do experiment in order to understand those works of art. It's actually better for us to start with works of art because at least for uh, recent work of art, we have documentation. We kind of know what they're made of. Uh, there's a lot of history. The, the, uh, the collaboration between scientists and art historians is important because there are documents that we can go to and try to confirm with our new methods of measurement that actually we, you know, we, can, we can have an agreement between the physical measurements and the documentation. In a lot of complex systems, we don't have this luxury. So you can view the collaboration between scientists and artists as a way to begin to approach complex systems in science. I think that the success of this program will open possibilities, will allow us to develop new models of thinking, how to approach complex systems in general. Another issue that we are faced now with in the scientific community is the, um, the, multi, uh, the, the multitude of data. Uh, samples in the past would generate, you know, a small number of data points that we could ha analyze using a pencil and a paper. Today, it's not rare for a system to generate billion data points in one second. And we need methods to analyze this data and understand what it means. A lot of the work that we fund in the National Science Foundation has to do with development of new methods for data analysis and interpretation. This program that we developed at the National Science Foundation at the interface of science and art allows the scientists and uh, scientists in the museums and scientists in academia to get this data, treat this data, analyze it, and develop new models that will allow other scientists in other fields to actually analyze and address their own systems. So we are looking here in this program for a two-way street. In the past, scientists in museums and artists and curators and conservators 
tend to, pay, uh, to pick. They took methods that have developed elsewhere, incorporate them into museums. In the program of the National Science Foundation, we asked the scientists and the scientists in academia and the scientists in museums to come up with new approaches, a new understanding of materials that will serve the, the entire scientific community to, in addressing different problems, not only the problems that are associated with the field of conservation science. How did I get to this? What happened? It's a complete coincidence that I got to it. I have to tell you a story. My wife is in the house. She's to blame. One day, you want to, she's to blame. So one day, I was invited to a symposium in the Art Institute of Chicago, um, that a symposium that was dedicated to the field of conservation science. I didn't really, uh, you know, I was traveling a lot that time, and I didn't really feel the, the urge to have another trip and be out of the house. So I told my wife, you got to come with me, otherwise I don't go. Um, and then she said, I can't go. I have too much work to do. And say, I'm not going to go. OK, two days later, said, this is sound too interesting to miss. We're going to go. And that's why we got to the Art Institute of Chicago, to this symposium. That's how I became familiar with the field. And what I found there in, this art in, in the Art Institute of Chicago, that people were talking in a, in a very strange language. There was so much chemistry and material science in what they said. But they just were using different words. I mean, what we were used to hear as uh, they were talking about fading, uh, like painting that are fading. And fading in chemistry is named photo bleaching. They were talking about um, structures, uh, deformations. We call them defects. They were talking about, they gave different names to, to, uh, to uh, chemicals, to molecules. We had the same molecules, we just named them differently. So it seems that th those two fields evolved somehow in parallel. The academic science was done one way, the museum science was done different way. They were all facing the same problem, but didn't really communicate very well. So I came home and said, we got to form a program that allows scientists in museums and academia to communicate, to talk to each other. We're going to tell them that if they come together and submit a proposal to the NSF in this area, together as a collaborative project, we will consider it. Now, this could have done in the past, could happen in the past as well. But the problem was, you know, you have to understand how funding agencies work. The proposal arrived to the funding agency, someone has to review it. If in this panel that reviewed the proposals, there is no representation for people who understand the problems that you know, that the museum scientists are faced every day, the probability for success of this kind of proposal is rather low. So the program that we initiated at the National Science Foundation not only asked the scientists in academia and the scientists in museums to work together, we also formed review panels of these two types of people together. And this is why the program succeeded. Um, how do we know that it's successful? There's a lot of media attention. There's a lot of interest from other countries. What started here is a small program, is now being copied in Germany, the UK, in France, in Italy, in Japan, in China, and soon enough, it's going to be incorporated into this international collaboration in chemistry program that was mentioned earlier in the introduction, allowing scientists not only in the United States to work on, uh, on problems in this field, but all around the world. I want to show you an example that you will have a feel because time is short. I hope that's going to work. Let's see. This is a project. Okay. There you go. Let's talk about after you see them. Nothing shines like polished silver, but keeping the tarnish at bay is never ending work. And polishing isn't just a pain. It also rubs away some of the precious metal, whether it's your grandmother's silver bowl or an 18th century museum treasure. So we're always looking for some kind of barrier that will protect the surface so that you don't have to keep polishing. At the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, the barrier of choice is lacquer brushed on by hand. Often it affects the color. The art conservators have an expert eye, and they say, oh, it has a bluish cast. 
Material scientist Ray Faniff and his team are working with the museum producing a protective coating so thin you can't see it with the naked eye. Using a special reactor inside a clean room, they produce nanometer thick films of aluminum oxide. The films conform to the recesses and protrusions of the silver, creating a protective barrier. The method that we use to, uh, to apply it is called atomic layer deposition. So literally, we're able to control the thickness of the film at, uh, at a sub-nanometer uh, level. An atom is one one-hundred-thousandth of the thickness of a human hair. Conservators say atomic layer deposition, or ALD, will have to pass rigorous testing before they use it to protect these irreplaceable treasures. That's the actual active element of any spectrometer. In the lab, they measure how light reflects off the surface of a test wafer and how the ALD coating affects its color. Another test measures how quickly sulfur penetrates the coated wafer. Sulfur is what tarnishes silver. This helps scientists figure out how long a barrier will last. If we can increase the, uh, the lifetime of these films to uh, a century, you may not need to do this very often. Conservators won't give ALD a thumbs up until they can show it works better than the lacquers they are using now, which have to be reapplied every decade or two. And also we're concerned about how it is removed. Right now with a lacquer you can remove it with solvents. If ALD proves a shining success, works like these will remain at their best for future generations to enjoy. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. Okay, good. So this is an example of one of the eight projects that we funded last year. Um, this year, we already received a group of uh, uh, proposals. Those proposals will be reviewed. Uh, we anticipate that there will be, I'm sorry. Uh, we anticipate that there will be uh, another group of maybe between five and eight additional awards that will join this program this year. Um, those, those proposals that have come are not only competing among themselves. They are competing against all proposals that are coming to, uh, uh, for consideration at the Division of Chemistry, a Division of Material Research at the NSF. So when they win, they win for real. This is not charity. This is high, high level science, what you see here. Um, I just want you to, to uh, realize that and when you go home, you know, you will understand that these proposals are for those projects are reviewed by a community of experts. Uh, this is not somebody sitting there in a dark room deciding I'm going to put money here, I'm going to put money there. This is a very transparent process and proposals that actually win this competition are top notch. Uh, with this I think I'm going to finish. I'm going to give the floor. Thank you. Thank you.